person. Yep. Hello, Jeff. Nice to meet you. Hi, Eric. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I view you as the world's foremost creativity coach. I'd be interested how you uh, see yourself or describe yourself or describe the work you do. Um, and I'd also love to hear what you think about the coaching field or industry. Like, is it, I just hear about so many more people becoming coaches. Do you think it's like red ocean and it's saturated or is it still totally blue sky and let everybody be a coach and let's, uh, there's, you know, enough food to go around. How do you perceive it? I think a while back, the International Coach Federation let, let out some statistics about how many clients their coaches or coaches in general actually saw. And the modal number was zero. That is most people who call themselves coaches or who train as coaches don't actually have clients mm -hmm. because they're worried about being face to face with another human being. They love the training. They love the idea of it. They love the idea of being of help and of being of service, but the transition from getting some training to having a coaching practice is actually a huge hurdle. So I don't think that the space is full at all. It doesn't, does not matter if many people get trained. What matters is how many people inhabit the space for real. And I think that number is probably still relatively small, comma. And I think it can grow and grow because I don't believe in the therapy model personally. I belong to movements called either critical psychology, critical psychiatry or anti-psychiatry, where we believe that the current paradigm as promoted by the American Psychiatric Association is a labeling paradigm and not a diagnosing and treating paradigm. And I think that coaching is more honest than therapy. By mandate, therapists are supposed to be diagnosing and treating mental illnesses. They don't really, what they really do is coach pretty much. Mm. But by mandate, they're supposed to be doing something different from coaching. They're supposed to be diagnosing mental disorders and treating them. I don't think that's what they're doing. When you open up a book, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association and use it as a shopping catalog, that isn't real diagnosing. Just, if you just think about it, that some master's level person is supposed to be doing a pseudo medical enterprise like diagnosing a mental disorder, it all falls apart when you look at it closely. This is all by way of saying, I think that coaching is a beautiful thing. I think it's straightforward and honest. You and your client name some goals. If your client can't name the goals, well, maybe you, the coach, suggest some, but at any rate, you get to a place of there being goals, and then you monitor the goals. So I think that that honesty of naming goals and monitoring goals is a wonderful paradigm. Uh, so there are all kinds of helpers that are needed. And I think coaches as helpers are one group that make a lot of sense. And I don't think we're anywhere near saturation. I think anything that is an issue could have coaches helping with that issue, whether it's, you know, being a lawyer and being burned out or whatever, whatever it is you could name, coaching mm -hmm. could help with that. So I think it's a robust profession. I like that it's unregulated. Somebody else might not mm -hmm. like that as an idea, right. but I like that it's unregulated. I like that you don't have to act like you need 72 years of training and 4,000 contact hours to coach because most people who enter coaching have a ton of life experiences. They've helped a ton of people, their kids, their mate, their friends, people at work. They've done a lot of helping already. And all they really need to do is to put on a couple of these hats, namely a, a supportive hat, a compassionate hat, a goal setting hat, Just put on a few hats and dig into the work, start to have clients. That's why I'm a big advocate in, in my trainings as you know, I'm a big advocate of mm -hmm. folks on just about the first day go, going and finding some free clients to coach because there's right. just no substitute for actually sitting across from somebody and doing this work. Reading about things, it's just not right. that important. 
Yeah, and there's no shortage of people who... I, I could go on, but... Yeah, and there's no shortage of people who need that kind of help, right? Who need just a, a, a space held or, or someone to bounce ideas off of or be seen in a certain way or... So what, in your opinion, makes a great coach? Like if somebody's all set up and ready to go, like what do they need to know? What, what can they aspire to be? What is, what is great in your mind? Well, first is personal anxiety management. Uh, a nervous coach is, is, a, is, is a person who's hard for the client to take, actually. That exacerbates the client's own anxiety. So there's a way in which calmness is, is a requisite quality. Not being worried about whether you're going to get it right or not. So an anti-perfectionistic mm -hmm. stance is important. Not needing the client to get anywhere, not needing the idea of progress to be front and center, just being present with the client, trying to identify what the client is actually after having some wisdom about what actually works and having some, I think, go-to strategies that are sensible. A go-to strategy might be knowing one kind of cognitive tactic so that you can help a person think thoughts that's serving her, having some tactics. I don't know if there's any one thing, I, I think it's <laughs> what that Supreme Court justice said about uh, pornography. I think you know it when you see it. Mm, mm -hmm. I think yep. you, you know a good coaching session or a good coach when, when you see that coach in operation. I think it is a lot about confidence though. And I think that's the same thing that matters when it comes to actually wanting clients. You have to have a certain kind of fearlessness being in the presence of another person. Same with therapy, a good therapist there have been a zillion outcome studies with respect to therapy. And it always comes down to not the therapist's theoretical orientation or anything you might think of. It's all relational. It's the, it's the therapist's warmth. That's what helps the client is the therapist's warmth, being a human being. So I think that's probably quite true for coaching also, just being a human being, being there for another person not needing any theories, not really needing too many tactics or strategies, but just being willing to be present. Where might, <laughs> where might a coach go to learn some of these things, to fill their toolbox with these things? <laughs> I, I want to say Paris just because I want to go somewhere. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, my trainings, uh, mm -hmm would be one place. Um, what I really want to say is there's no place for them to go. Once you get the headline that it's, that it's your job as a coach to sit opposite someone, tease out some goals and monitor the goals, that's the whole sentence. Yeah. Sit opposite someone, tease out some goals together, co-create some goals. What would you like to get done? and monitor that. Check in next week. Did you get it done? Where do you have to go to learn that thing? Nowhere. You have to stay put and do it. So there are tons of coaching books. I think my creativity coaching trainings are good. I'm, I'm sure other trainings are good. There are interesting existential coaching academies and this, that. And that. I'm sure there are lots of interesting places to go. But too many people take too many workshops and trainings mm. as a way to never sit opposite another human being. <laughs> so I guess my short response to your question, where should they go? Nowhere. Mm. They should stay put. Love it. I, I lead a coaching group now, um, a lot of, about a hundred or so um, coaches who are uh, most of them shifting from uh, one to one therapy um, model to um, group coaching practice and the subject has come up uh, what what qualifies me to be a coach 
And I've said it a couple times now to this group that there's, I don't need to have been a CEO or a rock star or a whatever, right? Or an author or whatever to coach people who are trying to run businesses or show up charismatically or do the work, right? All I need to do right. is sit with them and just see into the center of them and, and, and believe in their ultimate potential, have a white hot belief in human yep. potential. Yep. That's a belief and I have. have. And have language that you acquire over time that, that works in those situations. For instance, one bit of language that a coach needs in dealing with a person whose universe he or she doesn't understand is, how does that work in your world? I don't need to know if 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 right. you're about to give a, a summation to a jury and and your question is how do I make an excellent summation my response would be how does that work in your world what do you need to do to make an excellent summation is it extra rehearsing is it you know what is it you tell me yeah i send clients out to, this is very different from the therapy model i send clients out to do the work whatever the work is and I don't know what the work is. I mean, we can get that work named. Typically we can get that work named. And I do know that they're not gonna to get to the work unless they do it pretty regularly. That's why I have a new book out on the power of daily practice, why I sell clients on the idea of daily practice. Yeah. Whatever it is that's important to them, if they don't do it in a daily way, they probably won't do it. Yeah. It's how human beings operate. If you want to try to write your novel every 17th day, you're not going to get your novel written. Right. So in addition to this belief in human potential, are there other beliefs that great coaches should have? Is there something that they need to have in their worldview and a lens they need to look through or believe is true? Yeah, there is a lens. I mean, there is a lens I think they ought to look through. It, it, it takes a few sentences to describe, but let me go through it. I have a model of personality. I believe the personality is made up of three parts. First part is original personality. That's how we come into the world. And psychology pays no attention to original psychology, uh, into, about, pays no attention to original personality, takes it into account, not at all. But everybody who's had kids or puppies or kittens knows that every creature is already itself coming into the world. It's really important to understand this <clears throat> because a person may come into the world a little sadder than the next person, a little more anxious than the next person. That does not make that a mental disorder. That makes it a lifelong challenge, however. So that's important to realize that people may come into the world with lifelong challenges like sensitivity or intelligence. I think intelligence is its own challenge. That's why I did a whole book on what's it called? Um, why smart people hurt. Mm -hmm. So there's original personality. Then there's what I call formed personality. And that's, that's the way we sort of cement ourselves over time into our recognizable self. It's the way we repeat ourselves and do things without thinking and what have you. And then the third part is what I call available personality. That's our remaining freedom to become the person we want to become. Mm. And I think that simple model is very robust because it speaks to original stuff and it speaks to how, how sticky and stuck we get, the form personality part, but it also speaks to the fact that we can make change, that we, that we are a different person. We have more available personality the day after we move from addiction to recovery. That day has changed our whole personality, giving us more available personality. It doesn't mean we, we don't still have a form personality, and it doesn't mean that our original personality may not be contributing to our addictive tendencies. What it means though, is that, that we, we have done something profound and brilliant by entering into recovery. So I do think that a coach needs some sense, some personal sense of the relationship between stuckness, which is real, and change, which is real, how that works, including how the how planting seeds matters, that we may say something together now that you get a year and a half from now. I'm not going to know that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to know that you learned something from me today that you made use of 13 years from now. I'm never going to know that, but I'm confident that that may happen. That's why I don't need a lot to happen in a session. A lot of new coaches need stuff to happen in a session. I don't feel like anything happened in the session. You don't know 
<laughs> something didn't happen. You may have planted just the right seed. If the client is okay, then you should be okay. You shouldn't have a different expectation like, oh, I, I, I needed I needed the client to write her whole novel in those 30 minutes somehow, and she didn't, and she only wrote seven words, and oh my God, I'm a bad coach, et cetera. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wonder too, uh... It, 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 as related to what we all just well we're still going through which is this worldwide pandemic and i i'm going back to the very beginning of this and i remember there was this just brief glint hope of optimism that this would be just a brief short temporary thing we're all just going to have to kind of go inside for a while and hey this will be a great time to finish that book I'm writing or write record that album I've been meaning to write all of this stuff and then we got into the shit right and we got into the the real pandemic and really what was required of us uh, maybe just speaking for myself and realized well this isn't a time to be creative this is like there's other work I have to do now right I'm focusing on taking care of my family and there's inner work that I'm, I need to be doing and I didn't realize I needed to do it until I put this other thing down and now I'm focusing on this what can you say about what the pandemic has done to the creative process have you learned anything about it has it changed the way you think about creativity and That's what changed, might we I learn it hasn't changed the way I think, but I know that there are more disappointed creative performing artists than ever before. Yeah. That, that, that speaks directly to what you were just saying. Right. They thought they got some extra free time, that this was somehow going to be something like an opportunity, and they're not doing their work. And so they're more disappointed than ever and more in need of coaching than ever. Yeah. It, it has turned out in these center not holding times that the very idea of daily practice is more important than ever because that's anchoring. If you, I'll say a few consecutive sentences here. If you start your day, organizing your day around your life purposes in the plural, so I don't believe there's a purpose to life. I believe there are life purpose choices. There are the things we decide are important. We make those decisions. If you spend a minute first thing in the day saying, okay, here's my menu of life purposes. Here's my list. What can I get to today? That's anchoring. Rather than being pulled around by the nose by our perpetual to-do list, that's a different way of starting the day to say, okay, here are the seven things that are important to me, relationships, activism, career, service, creativity, whatever they are. Now I'm going to get to them, or I'm going to get to as many as I can. So I'm going to have multiple daily practices. I'm going to live a more organized life than I actually like. I would like to be that disorganized, chaotic teenager, but I know that doesn't work for me. I can't be that person who gets up on the two in the afternoon anymore, even though I wish I could be that person. Now I've got to get up at 5 a.m., which I do, and, get, and do the things that are important, live my life purposes. And so this is actually an opportunity to move from the way most people operate, which is organizing their day around their responsibilities, errands, duties, to-do list, and making the shift to organizing your life around your life purposes. And if you do that, A, you make yourself proud by your efforts. It reduces your, so to speak, depression. It reduces your despair. Makes life more meaningful. If you get to meaningful things on each day, life is more meaningful, sort of by definition. If you're doing meaningful things each day, life is more meaningful, etc. cetera. So, so long-winded answer to the, how are creative folks doing during this time? They're having a rough time, but it is also an opportunity to make this, I think, important switch from just trying to get things done to moving from that way of being to a new level of devotion to their mm -hmm. life purposes. Let me just say parenthetically, Pavarotti had a quote I like, which is, people say I'm disciplined and it's not discipline, it's devotion, and there's a mm -hmm. big difference. And I think creative folks often think that they're not disciplined enough, but that isn't what's going on. They're actually not devoted enough. They're not 
in love enough with mm -hmm. their own projects. They have trouble considering that what they're doing matters. Who needs another photograph? Who needs another song? Who needs another this? Who needs another that? So at, at the level of basic motivation, they have trouble keeping motivation afloat. The pandemic has not helped with that either. We've seen through to the void even more clearly, and it's hard to make sense of anything really mattering. So that's all by way of saying this is an existential extremity. And one of the answers to existential extremities is to settle down and have a serious conversation with yourself that you matter. Mm. That even though it feels hard to get agreement from yourself that you matter, you have to operate that way. And you have to believe that, that you and your efforts matter. Mm. Love it. Jeff, I'm going to throw it back over to you. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> I'm like over here. Going, oh, dang. Should we go back to anti psychiatry? <laughs> no. We should not. I'm over here telling myself I matter. You know? Good. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, let's let's not interrupt you telling yourself that you matter. Right, let's... right. Yeah, it's a. <laughs> the, um, I think it's interesting that that people are feeling it was a, this this gift of time, and so there's a, it's, it's a vicious cycle. It is. There is. You, yes. Yes. Um, and and if you don't have that conversation about your work mattering. It doesn't matter how much time you have, you're gonna just keep pushing it off. That's right. And let, let, me, let me speak to some of the details of this. So I try to sell every client who's a creative person on them beginning to institute a morning creativity practice. I find that, I think that's very important because the longer we don't get to our work, the longer we say, maybe, maybe I'll get to my work, the, the less likely we are to get to it the more likely that maybe we'll turn into a no. By the end of the day, we're not only tired, which we are, we're also a little blue because we haven't gotten to our real work. Mm -hmm. So for every creative person, I think starting the day with a morning creativity practice is a big deal. On a practical level, on a coaching level, on a tactical level, that's what you want to sell your clients on. Do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm very big on saying, do this. And so there are three reasons for to be a morning creativity practice. One is what I just said, you know, to try to do it the other way around is too hard. Most people can't do it at the end of the day. Second is that you get to make use of your sleep thinking by turning to your creative life first thing. You get to use what your brain's been working on through the night. We think while we sleep. Everybody knows we dream. Most people don't know we also think. We dream in REM sleep, we think in non-REM sleep, and creative folks are thinking all the time during the night. But when they turn to the new day, they lose all that good thinking. Whatever they were thinking about, it evaporates in, in, in the whirlwind of a new day. But if you start your day working on your novel or working on your song collection or working on your painting or working on whatever, you get to make use of whatever your brain, brain has been thinking about during the night. And that's a big deal thing especially if you go to bed the night before with a, what I call a sleep thinking prompt, a wonder. Like, mm. I wonder what Mary wants to say to John in chapter three. If you go to bed with that kind of wonder, your brain will work on the conversation between Mary and John and, and you can then just wake up and take dictation. <laughs> Which is a big deal. You've just added an hour or two to your creative life for free mm -hmm. by turning to your creative work first thing. It's a big deal. So A, you'd get a lot done. B, you'd get to make use of your sleep thinking. And C, you'd have the experience of having made some meaning on that day already. And the rest of the day can be half meaningless and you won't get depressed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a meaning capital, meaning capital work, building mm -hmm. meaning, meaning reservoir for the mm -hmm. day. And so, Joran, you were saying, you know, what do you say to a to a depressed person different from take a pill, 
Well, this is one of those things you say, which is if you get to some real, try getting to some real work first thing and see if that makes a difference in your mood. It will. It will if they get to it. If they keep avoiding it, that's not going to help their mood so much. That's why we monitor. Mm -hmm. That's why we that's why we wonder aloud to clients. Mm -hmm. I have clients, if they're willing, check in with me every day via email as to whether they did their daily work. And all they need to say is, I worked. That, that's a complete email. Mm -hmm. And my complete response is great. Mm -hmm. We have these huge interchanges. I worked mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it's important to monitor as a coach, not just have done some great work to set something up. And it can be a little scary to monitor, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it can be a little nerve wracking to actually get in somebody's face and say, did you, did you seven days a week? Did you work on your novel seven days a week this week? What's the client gonna say? No, mm -hmm. right? The clients, we, we have a lot of confessing clients, right? We have a lot of clients who are going to have to confess that they didn't get to whatever they said they were going to get to. And we need to know how to deal with that. We need to, need to know how to be gentle there. Yes, of course you didn't get to it seven days, but I love it that you got to it for three days. Mm -hmm. And let's see if next week we can ramp that up to four days. We have to find our way of being there with a person so that we celebrate what they did get done <clears throat> and continue to hold their feet to the fire. I, th I think you're you're I think you're on the edge of answering this question for me. But I yeah I heard you a minute ago say I find myself as a coach saying do this a lot right, and for me my coaching like my world view is that I do three things in a coaching session I set boundaries I talk about when the call begins when the call is going to end I begin to hold space for the client I just empty this out for them to be in and whatever they're going to bring to that session is what they bring and then begins this third phase which is to me very much like a, a soccer or a basketball game where they try to score <laughs> ne negative thoughts in one basket behind me and i'm blocking the shots with reframes and saying no 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 and i'm working my way back down the other side of the court trying to do reframes and turnarounds and say how else might we look at that but it speaks to this level of like assertiveness or aggression or advice giving. How much is too much do you think for a coach to, to push someone, a client? It all depends on your language skills. Mm. To say even one pushy thing the wrong way ruins the relationship. But to say a million pushing things the right way is no problem. So and this takes experience. So my languaging would be, I wonder if you might think about da blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. not do this. It mm -hmm. would never be do this. Right. One, do this, and you've set yourself up for the relationship ending. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's, there's a subtlety there because I'm saying do a lot of it, but do it well. <laughs> right. Doing it poorly is not good. And so what does that mean? You'll lose your first clients, won't you? Because you'll do it poorly for the first nine clients, won't you? Or the first 32 clients or whatever. Yeah. So I, I'm just pausing there for effect because coaches like creatives don't want to engage in the real process. The real process is you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Whether you're writing a novel or working with first clients, you're going to say a thing to, in a too pushy way or in too assertive way or too authoritarian way. Yes, you're gonna do that. And the person's gonna say, I didn't like that. And it doesn't wanna come back. And you're gonna go, I'm not a coach. No, you're not gonna say, I'm not a coach. You're gonna say, ah, process. Mm -hmm. You're gonna say, ah, learning experience. Most coaches, most creatives can't say that. They can't say, ah, process. What they do is they attack themselves. Mm -hmm. They say, I'm not a coach. That was stupid. That was really poorly done, etc." So I spend a lot of time with creatives, inviting them to actually understand the creative process. And the phrase goes in one ear and out the other, like, of course I understand the creative process. They don't get it at all. They don't get the extent to which they have to have real permission to make mistakes and messes. Mm -hmm. Real permission to spend two years on a novel that doesn't work, who wants to hear that? <laughs> There's like nobody who wants to hear that. <laughs> 
but that's the real process. Maybe it's your second book that will be good. You mean I have to do a first bad book? I don't know, but you've got to show up and do that first book. (laughs) To know it's bad, right? And I use, I have lots of analogies and metaphors and, you know, I'll go, you know, how many of Bob Dylan's 3000 songs are brilliant? 30. Well, that's like, what is that? One tenth of a percent, et cetera. Or uh, Beethoven's first, third, fifth, seventh, and ninth symphonies are better than a second, fourth, sixth, and eight. But you can't do nine without eight. You can't do eight without (laughs) seven. It's all different ways of saying the same thing. You can't avoid the process. And folks, creative folks really do want a guarantee. They're sitting there going, I'm not going to start this thing until I feel like I have a guarantee that it's going to work. They will sit there a very long time. Yes. I'm not sure what that was in response to, but (laughs) there we are. (laughs) Well, and it it evokes the Cory Doctorow wrote this book, uh, Information Doesn't Want to Be Free. And he said that we need to move away from the mammalian method of nurturing ideas for nine months and gently, you know, nosing one idea away from the fire (laughs) or the cliff or the spears or the whatever, and move more toward the, uh, the, the dandelion method, which is blow those seeds far and wide and one's going to stick over there and one's not going to stick over there and one's going to try to come up in the cracks right so how are we just launching version 1.0 1.1 1.2 and just get them out there and i tell clients when we talk about thoughts that serve and thoughts that don't serve i tell them one of the thoughts that will serve you is sooner rather than later i I like simple language sooner Mm -hmm. rather than later and they all, let's, for, let's say a writer client, every writer client knows of some writer who took 17 years to write their book. They love that because they're, on, they're only on year 15 of their book, so they're still ahead of the game. Right. So they love that. But I counter that with Simonon, the Belgian novelist who wrote the Nagre mystery series and thousands of novels. He wrote every book in three, three weeks time. That was his model. And I say to clients, it's not that you're supposed to write a book in three weeks. It's that some people do things quickly and mm-hmm. that's okay, isn't it? Sooner rather than later is okay. I want them to break that idea that things are supposed to take forever. Right. Because that's, of course, a game they're playing with themselves because they're, in fact, not showing up. It wasn't that their book took seven years. It's that they didn't show up for six and a half of those years. They weren't writing a book for seven years. They were writing a book for 30 days of those seven years. Mm-hmm. So this is, we're, we're saying the same thing, which is mm-hmm. we have to get our clients to show up to the work. They get to name the work, but I get to press them about showing up to the work. That's definitely part of my job as I see it. <clears throat> How do you know tactically that you've pushed too hard? What are some of the red flags or responses that you might look out for as a coach? <laughs> I'm not sure offhand what comes to mind uh, in terms of what the, what the linguistics will be, but it is perfectly clear. I, I'm not sure what it is I'm hearing in my head that mm. a client is saying. Um, the initial calibrating is very important. And I think Beginning coaches expect too much from clients. I expect lots from clients, but I also don't expect too much from clients. So a new client, if I ask a new client, we're talking, let's say we're talking about this daily morning creativity practice that we're just chatting about. I'll ask a client, how how much time do you want to spend each day on this practice? That is, I'm not going to make a suggestion about time. How much time do you want to spend? Almost invariably, the client will say 20 minutes. Mm. You could like, if you wanted to do a little betting on things, you could put Mm. down your quarter on 20 minutes. Why? Because they don't want to disappoint themselves again. Mm. They don't want to say two hours when they know they're not going to do two hours. They don't want to say 90 minutes when they know they're not going to do 90 minutes. So they're picking this very small time. And so a new coach might go, Internally, 20 minutes. Can I, can I arm wrestle her to an hour or something? Mm-hmm. But that, that's why I don't get much pushback as to having set something up incorrectly because I'm going with a client's 
intuition. And actually, if a client would say, let me shoot for, let's say it's a client with a day job and three young kids who says, I'm going to spend two hours each day on this. Right. I'm not going to buy it. Right. And say, wow, that's wonderful that you think you could spend two hours on it. For this week, let's try 20 minutes, shall we? Yeah. I'm going to massage, I'm going to dial that back. Because yeah. that's a setup for, for disappointment and failure. And now, you know, we, it's all about the hearing correctly. If there is this amazing person who can do her nine to five job and manage her three kids and get two hours in, and I hear that that's possible somehow. Maybe mm -hmm. I hear it's possible because she's written 19 books before. Mm -hmm. Maybe I know she's a different person from a usual client who has not been that productive. Maybe she's super productive in that old cliche about, you know, give the busiest person in the office more work mm -hmm. so that it'll get done. That may be that those two hours may be exactly what she means. So right. there's a lot of understanding and, and hearing correctly that a coach needs to do to know whether to dial a client back from two hours to 20 minutes or let that client go with the two hours because you have confidence that she can pull that off. Yeah. Yeah. And so you would just cut right to it and not like what I hear. Well, I heard you say you were really busy. Is there a different time? You would just suggest, well, how about we just do 20? You would just suggest 20. If, if I was on the fence, if was on the fence, I would let the client go with what she says she wants to do, even if I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. even, so I, in the back of my mind, I would know that we were setting ourselves up for a disappointing week. But because I'm not sure she can't pull that off, I want to give her what she says she wants. Yeah. Because she's going to prove it. Just yeah. clear. If it was clear yeah. to me that she was setting herself up for disappointment, then I would go directly to, I'd pick a number. Yeah. So it's, there's subtleties here, as we know, right. there, there's lots of subtleties in, in how to respond. And it's all about the actual client and also the client's history. I'm not a history taker, but I have all clients answer three questions. And from those three questions, I get a good, decent understanding of their history with respect to creating. And that helps me a lot. I already have ideas before our mm -hmm. first session of what we'll be talking about, what I'll be saying, where we'll be going, all of that. I already know quite a bit about where we're going from, uh, from a new client's answers to those three questions. I know we only have about, I don't know, seven or eight minutes left here, but I just, you've been coaching a long time and in your career, are there big themes or patterns or threads that you just that you have observed and you now know to be a macro right that just works across all people well that sounds like sort of the tactical level um, and i would say on a tactical level that acting as if the client can do it matters and that using we language really matters. We can get this done this week, can't we? Mm. That, that you, you can get this, this, it's very different to say, you can get this done this week, can't you? Versus we can get this done this week, can't we? Mm. Uh, that's a very big deal thing. And there's probably a lot to say about that we formulation about how we're in this together somehow that matters. Predicting success matters, but you've got to define success correctly. Meaning a client who has not written in seven years, if you're expecting success to sound like gets her novel written in the next two months, well, then you've misdefined success. Mm -hmm. But if you get that client to be now doing couple of hundred words a day, four days a week, my gosh, that's so for me, I am predicting success with every client, including those clients who have never gotten the work done. Never have, mm -hmm. have always found a way to deflect themselves, started a new career, started a new business, 
married for the fourth time, whatever, they just managed to never sit down and write that novel. I'm not worried about that. So I'm not sure what I'm saying here exactly, except I have faith in people. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason I have that faith, especially around creativity, is I actually know how deep the love is. I know that the folks fell in love with books or films or music or what have you at the age of five or six or seven. And that was as deep a love as any love they're ever going to experience. That experience of sitting in a, in a corner of a room as a seven-year-old reading a book that was important to you is such a profound experience that you've always, th there's some reservoir there of love that still is here today. It's been overlaid by all kinds of crap but it's still there and I can, I can get you connected back up to that love of reading a book at seven so that you will make an effort to write your own book. Hmm. Love it. Well, Eric, where, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us today. This has been amazing and uh, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you showing up uh, to have this conversation with us. Where can people go to learn more about you and your work? To my site, ericmazel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. They can also take a peek at recent books. Um, the most recent is called The Power of Daily Practice, which, of course, speaks to some of the things we just talked about. It describes the elements of practice, varieties of practice, and also challenges to daily practice. It's a good book. And then I have a book coming out in a little while called Redesign Your Mind, which is an interesting book. It sort of moves cognitive therapy ahead, I think. Mm -hmm. And it makes, it makes a distinction between thinking thoughts that serve and the source of those thoughts, actually changing our mind so that we begin to think thoughts that serve us. So that comes out in the fall, Redesign Your Mind. And visiting my site is the place to go. And if, and if there are coaches on the call, which presumably there are coaches on the call. Mm -hmm. I have a support group for coaches also. It's a free support group. And um, you drop me an email to ericmazel at hotmail.com and I can tell you how to join that free support group. Awesome. And I want to put a plug in for both your affirmations for artists and also coaching the artist within. Those two were life-changing for me. And I recommend them to anyone listening. And affirmations for artists must be 30-ish years old. So that's going way back. <laughs> that's awesome. Eric, it was so good to finally meet you in person. I know we've been communicating for years via email. Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's been really, really great to have this conversation with you today. Have an amazing rest of your Friday and a great weekend. Great. Thanks for having me. And yeah, you bet. Talk to you soon. Great meeting you.